which I'm very glad indeed to have an opportunity to take part in this discussion. And um, essentially, I just want to flag four points that are coming up in the discussion so far and see if we can take them forward a bit. But before doing that, just put the whole thing in a particular context, which is the point I've made elsewhere. And it's, it's the point that if universities are a public good, we have to reclaim and argue for the whole notion of public good in a society which is rapidly losing sight of that in an increasingly marketized, functionalized and trivialized environment. So I hope that we don't lose sight of that, that bigger political and social agenda, which in the context of which this makes sense. But let me take the, the four points I've wanted to pick up so far from the discussion. First of all is I'm very glad that we've had mention of FE in this connection. To have a joined up approach between FE and HE is not only a way of avoiding a completely sterile kind of competition between those two, it's also, I think, holding on to what I regard as a fundamental principle here, which is that the supposed standoff, which some people talk about between access, widened access, and excellence is a fiction. Widened access and sustained excellence ought to be part of exactly the same agenda. But they will only be that if there is the proper kind of consistent investment in the entire post-18 educational world, where there is a sense that you don't have to, so to speak, you don't have to struggle all the time to pay bills by raising funds and cutting expenditure in the ways that people have already talked about and destabilizing the institution. If you have that consistent view that we aim in higher education to give the best possible education to students in a way that sets them free to be critical participants in their society. And we do that obviously, with an eye to the widest possible participation, because if you want educated citizens, you want lots of educated citizens, you want an educated civic body. So I hope we can hang on to that unity of purpose between those two ideals. I've sometimes said that the educational, the higher educational policies of the last couple of decades have left us with a sense that government pushes at us sometimes three or more, but at least three incompatible demands. Sustained excellence to keep up our international reputation, widening access and reduced expenditure. And, you know, 45 seconds reflection ought to tell you that that won't add up. So that's, that's the first point. A joined up approach to FE and HE and a consistent approach to the coherence, the interconnection, access and excellence. Second point is the word growth that's come up from time to time, particularly in connection with um, the growth of the national economy. We are increasingly, of course, seeing education of all kinds and particularly HE conceived very much in the context of talk about economic growth and that is usually translated into crudely economic or economistic metrics for good education, measuring the excellence of teaching by the level of graduate salary, which is, as I've said on many occasions, um, a remarkable kind of judgment when you think of the excellence of many people's training as primary school teachers, or whatever, but that's another story. Point is, I think, that in this wider context that I'm trying to suggest to people, we have to look at certain models of economic growth. And we have to ask what it is that will make our society move towards sustainable and just forms of growth. That's certainly something to do with the ecological crisis that we're all living through. But I think it's also to do with the rebalancing of our economy, the valuing of those prosaic so-called low-skill jobs which have turned out to be so important in recent months, 
It's to do with a rebasing of our society on a broader valuation of different kinds of skill and complementary kinds of excellence. I, I've been involved for the past few years with um, the Center for the Understanding of Sustainable Prosperity based at the University of Surrey with Professor Jim Jackson. And that kind of issue comes up there many, many times. But it seems to me that if we get it right in thinking about higher education, we are actually creating an intellectual force in this country which will continue to press the, the right kinds of argument about sustainable growth and sustainable prosperity in a way which will, in the long run, make us a more just, a more durable, a more interactive society. So I don't think getting it right in higher education is just an end in itself. It is very much about looking at that wider context and therefore challenging narrow views of growth on what I called economistic measures of excellence and success. For that to happen, we need to think of our higher education institutions as potentially transformative institutions, critical deliverers of change, and therefore critical deliverers of policies that release skills, that speak hopefully to communities that have not had access, not just to education, but to a voice in society. I take it that most of us would, would agree very strongly with that, but Here's, here's the, um, the footnote, as it were. I was earlier today in a long meeting of a, a trustee body of a charity I'm involved in, which is going through quite considerable rebasing at the moment. And concern was expressed quite rightly about the strain it's putting on our staff. And somebody said, I think very, very shrewdly, to deliver transformative policies you need confident, motivated staff. If you have a staff who are overloaded, undervalued, marginalized, casualized, and so forth, you won't actually deliver a transformative policy. Now, I don't think I need to spell out in too much detail how that applies to the HE sector at the moment. We have seen over the last few years, not just the casualization of academic labor, but in so many institutions, and I you know, can't even start counting them in terms of friends of mine who've been through this experience. So many institutions we've had, frankly, bullying and harassment towards academic staff and a general sense of power and control slipping away from practitioners. Part of the morale of the profession is about making decisions about your own well-being, your own future. And that's why issues about governance and control are key to how we understand the future of higher education. You cannot deliver a properly transformative, a properly, properly liberating practice of higher education or indeed any kind of institution, any kind of education by undermining the morale of the professionals who deliver it. And that seems to me really axiomatic. And then the last point I'd want to make here, I think is, this is of course, a very diverse sector. And we've already heard, I think very helpful affirmations, not least from Emma, about that diversity. Diversity, when it really works, is of course collaborative diversity. It's people recognizing that others are doing what you can't do, that you need to work with the grain of what they're doing in order to do what you want to do. The more the sector is reduced to competitive bottom line terms, the less you'll see of that. And of course that applies, as I said earlier on, to FE and HE together. So I would hope that in addition to the other points I've made, we, we bear in mind that the diversity of the sector ought to mean greater attention, more intelligent attention to collaboration and cooperation. We have unfortunately, not only a competitive, but almost a, a silo-like 
attitude to higher education institutions in this country, not traditionally associated with such institutions, let's say, in continental Europe. And maybe there's a question there that we need to look at for the middle distance about how we create a more interactive, more genuinely collaborative framework for HE generally. But for that to happen, of course, we need to rethink the barbarizing policies of recent years, which have pushed us into those silos and sealed them off. So there we are, a broad sense of how we become as HE professionals part of an agenda pursuing the very idea of public good and public purpose, a strong commitment to the coherence of widened access and sustained excellence, a critical attitude to some models of growth and its metrics, a focus on the transformational capacity of the institution and the need for the building of morale, not its undermining, and the cooperative attitude we need in HE in order to deliver what we're capable of as institutions of critique and transformation in society. One is picking up on something that's just been in the margins of what's been talked about recently, but flagged up a bit earlier. Um, if we're looking at accountability as a general theme in higher education, um, we do need to, to name and, um, well, name and shame, instances of cosmetic expenditure, as people have pointed out in various ways, and look for the, a proper system of accountability within our governance. People have said quite rightly, governance is, poor governance is at the root of a lot of this. So that's one thing. Second thing is, um, as I think Harambos was suggesting, we need a positive vision, not just um, a tick list of things we're against, but a real integral vision of education within our society. And we're all well placed, I think, to, to articulate that and push it forward. Third thing, very practically, and again, something I've said in other contexts, make sure that we, we get both um, current researchers and new academics in the profession signed up to this agenda and this vision and this pushback to what's confronting us. Thank you.